It's about to. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter is proud to have uh, Raven Antiquera as the speaker of its 10th talk of the invited seminar series. Uh, Raven is the Chief Information Security Officer at Dispatch Tech, the San Diego based cybersecurity company focused on cyber cybersecurity maturity model certification, CMMC implementation, and consultation. Uh, he's a registered practitioner and certified CMMC professional. Uh, Raven employs his expertise in compliance, security, and soci sociology to address small to medium business concerns uh, within the defense industrial base. Uh, he seeks to explain complicated CMMC, Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, and Federal Acquisition uh, Regulation, requirements and concepts in layman's terms, uh, to help educate the DIB. Uh, Raven is a second generation Filipino American who lives in San Diego, California, and comes from a, a military family with specialty in logistics and supply chain. He holds bachelor's in sociology and frequently assists with local workforce and education development programs. Today, he will be talking about cybersecurity in today's world and the rise of artificial intelligence. Please. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Hey everyone, welcome to today's IEEE hybrid talk. Today's topic is going to be cybersecurity today and the rise of AI. First, let me introduce myself as well. My name is Raven Antikara. I am the Chief Information Security Officer at Dispatch Tech Inc., a local San Diego cybersecurity firm. I am a certified CMC professional, which right now is a jumble of acronyms, but I'll be sure to explain that in shortly. And I've also graduated from CSU Northridge with a sociology degree. So my pathway to here is an adventure on its own, but thank you for having me here. So first, let's talk about recent cybersecurity events that have occurred within the last two to four years that were pretty major. Some of these you may have seen the headlines of, and a lot of them have lingering impacts that we're still experiencing today. So first, let's talk about two cybersecurity attacks that were trending on the news within the last three years, the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack and the MGM cyber attack. The Colonial Pipeline attack occurred on May 7th, 2021. And for those of you who are not familiar with the event, basically ransomware struck the Colonial Pipeline and cutting off gas pump lines all across the Southeast of the United States. This was through a compromised employee password in a data breach. And the way that the hacker group obtained this employee bath password was basically, there's a giant data breach of passwords where there's a huge list online and they went through every single password. And what they did was it coincided it with another login that employee had at the Colonial Pipeline. And this login turned out to be tied to the employee's LinkedIn. So because they shared the same credentials as their LinkedIn login, they're able to compromise their employee account and initiate a ransomware attack. This effectively shut down the pipeline for approximately a week, and the ransom was actually paid out in Bitcoin. To this day, only a portion of the Bitcoin transactions have actually been recovered, and I believe the total amount was only about $2.2 .2 million was recovered. Next, let's talk about the MGM cyber attack. This happened on September 11th, 2023. Now, while the Colonial Pipeline attack was a ransomware attack using the password data breach and coinciding the credentials to get into sensitive information, the MGM cyber attack is actually more interesting as it is a socially engineered attack. The, cy the cyber hacker group, basically what they did was they called the help desk of MGM, the IT help desk, and they frequently talked with the people there until they're able to convince them to reset the credentials on a global admin account. Now, once they got access to that, they performed a ransomware attack, which effectively shut down a huge portion of MGM, totaling in about approximately $100 million of loss. Now, the information due to the press release from MGM revealed that for customers' data itself, 
only customer names, contact information, gender, date of birth, driver's license were reported stolen by the hacker group. But for some, their social security numbers and passports were also stolen as identification. Currently, MGM is still going through the recovery process of data and informing people of what they've lost. But they were able to recover from this attack. And most recently, while this is not a cyber attack, this is very relevant. The CrowdStrike Falcon update failure. For those of you who did not know, on July 19th, 2024 of this year, CrowdStrike, which is a extended detection response platform, basically in layman terms, kind of like an antivirus, had an update. And what happened with this update was that it completely failed. Now, this failure was not a normal type of failure. Instead, it caused Windows devices that were running CrowdStrike to have blue screens of death, which is basically the PC itself is unrecoverable. And due to the way that CrowdStrike works, you would have to remediate this by either physically accessing the computer or if you're able to actually connect it to the internet and run scripts, use a script to remove the failed update. This caused a disruption globally of banks, airlines, hotels, hospitals, government agencies, and more. 8.5 million devices estimated were affected by the CrowdStrike Falcon disruption. Now, the underlying way that this update failed was basically the template instance for Falcon was supposed to search for a value. And what happened was the update that was pushed out to devices was potentially the incorrect update as it was trying to call upon a value that did not exist, which resulted in an out of bounds exception error causing the blue screen of death. Now, you might be wondering, well, with these cybersecurity attacks within the last four years and cybersecurity issues that we've run into with these updates that cause huge disruptions and downtimes and millions of dollars of loss, what is the government doing towards this position? And that's where we enter into my specialty, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, which is a mouthful. Basically, 14 years ago, we decided to classify sensitive data. And when we classify that sensitive data, we decided that we need a way to protect it from cyber, secure, from cyber criminals. And that's when we obtained the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, also known as CMMC. CMMC was officially published not 14 years ago, but the proposed rule only December 26, 2023. And we've just barely finished the public comment period and we're still going through more regulations of this rule. For those of you who are familiar with the cybersecurity frameworks, this is basically a program to assess specifically the defense industrial base on their implementation of the National Institute of Science and Technologies Special Publication 800-171, or in layman terms, basically 110 controls that you need to implement for cybersecurity across 14 domains. This is anything from making sure you have the correct encryption, making sure multi-factor authentication is on, password policies are on, and goes into social aspects of it as well, making sure your employees are properly trained and preventing insider threats. Now, this program, we are looking to go live potentially sometime around the summer of 2025. Now, while it only affects the defense industrial base today, the ruling 14 years ago that established sensitive data goes across every industry that we could possibly think of, whether it's health information, attorney information, banking information, all of this will eventually trickle down into requiring some sort of assessment that you see published right here. So that way, as a country, we have a cybersecurity baseline to the NIST standards. And that leads directly into what are some cybersecurity awareness and training things that you need to be aware of right now. Now, this one I'm gonna handle more as a discussion. So first, let me talk to you about passwords. Similar to the colonial pipeline attack, passwords are the key to your account. 
it sounds like a, you know, yeah, no brainer. You should use the password and enter your account, but what makes the password good? So first let's talk about complexity. So that password is password one, two, three. This is most likely the password I guess anytime I'm trying to visit any of my clients and I'm thinking, oh shoot, I need to get into their computer. I'll try password one, two, three, and sometimes it works, which is not a good sign. So generally speaking with password complexity, you've seen this whenever you try to sign up for an account, you wanna add at least a special character, uppercase, and something that's easy to remember for yourself. Now here's the issue. So this is kind of a strong password that you see up on the screen, but 30 days rolls around, 60 days rolls around, 90 days rolls around, and you get the dreaded email that you need to change your password. So the easiest way that a lot of people change their passwords is that they'll add a one. And this will qualify. For a large amount of services that you enter your password, this will qualify. Now the issue though, is another 60 day comes up and then we change that one to a two and then a three and then a four. And before you know it, you're using the same exact password across all of your social media accounts, your employee accounts, you are sharing the same password, whether it is sequential. And the issue with this is in this example, we have LinkedIn, we have X, we have Instagram and a gaming service on the screen. Now, What's special about this is if we are sharing the same password and it's sequential, you're one data breach away from basically your password being brute forced attacked. What happens in these data breaches is that usually information is leaked, such as your password, your email for a service you sign up for. Now what hackers do is they'll take that password and they'll take that email and simply put, they'll just try it on major, on especially on major social media like LinkedIn, X, and also Facebook is a great example. Now, the second that they get into one account, they could probably guess that you're probably using the same exact password, especially if it's something sequential on your other services. When we do vulnerability scans across our clients, it is very common to see the same password across 20, maybe even 30 different types of services. And now the issue with that is our clients also don't know until that vulnerability scan how many times that password has come up. And my CEO, Aaron Wine, is also here on the side, and you can nod yes to confirm, but I believe the high score for amount of breaches is somewhere around 20,000 for a single password, meaning that that one password has appeared over 20,000 times in different data breaches. And that's huge because that same password was also used for not only their company account, but also Amazon, Facebook, Crunchyroll, LinkedIn, across every single social media that they use, you can now access it by using that password that appeared in over 20,000 breaches. So the solution that I have, and this is a very easy solution to use, is rather than remembering all these passwords that you've sequentially added to three, four, two, Use the password manager. Password managers are available in many different forms. Some of them are subscription based, some of them are not. Uh, generally speaking, what you're looking for in a password manager is the ability to have it encrypted is the first rule, is make sure your password manager is actually encrypted. So in case your computer is compromised, your passwords are not leaked. And a good example of this is when we look at 2022 LastPass, had a data breach that revealed their source code being taken away. Now, the significance of that is that LastPass functions like any other password manager. You have a master password. This is one password that you know and allows you to access your whole database of randomly generated passwords. Now, LastPass did reveal that while their source code was leaked in the initial press release statements, there was no leakage of the actual passwords. They stayed encrypted. And that's a good thing that you wanna be looking out for. Now, for password managers, I personally use one that's provided by my company. And that one allows me to have multiple licenses that I actually handed out to friends and family to try and get them to not use the same password, such as my parents, for example. For them, they use the same password across everything, but now with the password managers, everything is randomized and they only have to remember one master password. 
Now, on top of that, though, password managers aren't the end all be all. You have to make sure you have turned on this very important feature that is usually available across any service that actually cares about their security. And that is multi factor authentication. Multi factor authentication is one of the most important things you can have. Whether your password is data breach or not, you're able to see that no one has logged into your account because they're still missing the second step to log into your account. And that is a second form of verification. So, as a little story of what actually happened to me personally, back in, I think, around 2015, Ubisoft had a data breach. And for me, I had not logged into my Ubisoft account for over, I'd say, three to four years. But the second that I tried playing a game, I noticed that my name was changing from Raven to a Russian name. And it was confusing me as I was playing a game where you do play a Russian. So I was like, what, what is happening here? And that's when I checked the logs. I checked the login history and I revealed that even though this person had access to my account, they didn't have the second part of the multi-factor authentication. So potentially they stole a cookie, were able to authenticate on their end, access my account, play on my account, change everything, but they could not reset the email due to multi-factor authentication on my email itself. So once I contacted Ubisoft support, everything was settled, I turned on multi-factor, and I've never had a cybersecurity incident on my Ubisoft account specifically ever again. Now, what you see up on the screen are some examples that you may see for multi-factor. Starting from the left, this is usually something that you'll see more on the enterprise end, which is Duo. Duo is owned by Cisco, and this does perform quite a lot of different types of multi-factor. For us as a company, we do duo with our technicians and that allows them to tap to guarantee that the person who is entering whatever server or computer they're using is actually the correct person. Now moving on to physical keys, we do have Yubico as an example. There's a lot of different types. So what you're seeing on the screen is not the only companies that provide these kinds of services as well. So I should reiterate that. So Yubikio does provide a type of key that allows you to physically input it into your computer, and that is what you're using for authentication. So it's impossible to actually log into certain services unless you have the key. And this is one of the most common and most widely available and is also free, the Google Authenticator. Now, Google Authenticator is a pretty standard way you scan a QR code or you enter a secret key, and that loads it into your account. You can also, as of a recent update, back up those codes to a Gmail that you use. Now, the issue is, are the areas it's backing up to secure, or are they not? That might be a different topic altogether. But there's also another different way that you can multi-factor authenticate, and that is text messages. So. That brings into a question though, if you can multi-factor authenticate with your phone versus an application, why not use your phone number every single time? And that's where I've created this slide. So application or text message, the pros and cons between the both. Now, the thing about an application is that your 2FA code is cycling and it is encrypted, but that also means it is locked down to the device that is producing the 2FAs unless you're scanning that QR code across multiple devices or you have the ability to back up your 2FAs to multiple devices. So the con about this is that you may lose access to your 2FAs, which requires you to enter a bag of code or contact support and provide evidence that you are the account owner in order to reset your account. Now with text messages, this is where it can get a little scary. It is tied to your phone number, so the convenience is there, meaning that let's say your phone enters a tragic accident and explodes, then you can pick up a new phone, call your carrier, transfer your phone number, and all your 2FAs that go to that phone number do transfer as well. But the issue is that this introduces a new attack vector called SIM card swaps, where someone can impersonate you, go to a physical store, and have a representative swap your SIM card into your phone. Now, a lot of phone companies now are aware of the scam and there are different types of security thresholds to protect yourself. But 
that does go into our next topic of social engineering. Now, social engineering is a cybersecurity concept where rather than trying to break into the software itself, you're socially engineering as in talking with an actual human being to give them access that you shouldn't have. If you recall, we were talking about recent cybersecurity attacks, the MGM cybersecurity attack was through social engineering of the IT help desk. So basically what they did was they basically kept calling that IT help desk, fatiguing them into thinking that you're just an employee who's always looking for a password reset, that you're constantly forgetting your password. It might be the joke on the tickets that, oh man, you know, John Doe keeps forgetting his password. But in reality, what you're doing is slowly building trust. And the more that you build and build upon those layers of trust, the more access you're able to get. And let's talk about what you need to look for. So for social engineering, the biggest thing you need to look for is trust. Because trust can override your instincts that something fishy is going on. So for example, as a chief information security officer of our company, if I was to call on a lower level technician, they most likely would see my name, they'd hear my voice, they would see me physically if I'm physically in the office and grant any requests that I need, whether it's a password reset or something miscellaneous. And even if it's something fishy, like, hey, can I get the global admin password reset for this? They might actually push through with it with trust. So with social engineering, you always have to make sure that you're looking for even if you trust the person in the company, or if it's an email or a phone call you're receiving, you want to make sure that just like multi-factor authentication, you have some sort of way that allows you to verify the person is actually there. And that sounds weird, but we're gonna to touch upon that at the very end. So let's talk about phishing. Now, phishing has evolved into a lot of different definitions, but the overall concept is that you're trying to obtain information by presenting something that enables trust and has the person divulge the information. So let's talk about a common phishing scenario. I get these daily, and luckily they're all spam filtered, but I get an email and it tells me simply, hey, your USPS package is delayed. Now for me, I have a lot of orders that always come to my house and there's a very significantly high chance it's being delivered by USPS. But once I receive that email that the USPS package has been delayed, you look at the sender and there's quite a lot of different things that you should notice. So here's the step-by-step -step process of what I usually do when I get these kinds of phishing emails I'm not too sure, is always verify the email sender. Some kinds of companies occasionally use aliases and it might look a little weird and that's actually the real one but you should always trust your instinct which is number three now with the email senders what i usually notice on the phishing attempts is that they come from a gmail account and this is because a gmail account can actually bypass quite a lot of security features especially on the spam area so if we set up our email filtering correctly and use a gmail account there's a significantly high chance it'll actually go all the way through all those email filters and end up in the target's inbox. So for you as a person, what you need to look for after you receive that email, if you clicked it, is to always check the URL. If you think it is legitimate and the email sender looks legit, then that URL might be the giveaway about you being targeted as a phishing attempt. And the biggest advice I have is to trust your instinct. If something seems fishy, you can always call the person to verify. But that also leads into another type of phishing scam where they actually put the phone number right in the email and you get redirected to a person who then has you divulge information. So, you know, there, there's always a way to dissect these kinds of phishing emails. And if you're not too sure, you should always send the phishing email or at least report the phishing email to your cybersecurity team so they can look over it to verify the validity of it. And in the effect that all this fails and you entered your password and realized that the last second you've been fished, you should reset your compromised password as soon as possible 
And usually on services, there is a sign out of all login locations. You should click that and then make sure to monitor your account. Now, let's talk about a social engineering scenario. So this happened to me, not yesterday, but 20 years ago, actually, in 2004. And in 2004, as a wee little raven, I played a game called RuneScape. And this is a game that you can play currently known as Old School RuneScape. And this is the perfect way if you want to test your social engineering. Now, 20 years ago, I would not fall for this ever again. But people in this game like to do something where they build your trust over time. So at first, they'll see your new player and say, hey, you should join in. You should do all these things with us and have a great time. But as they build that trust, they're waiting for a big payoff. Now, for me in 2004, as a child, I had no clue about this. And there's a famous scam where people will tell you, hey, if you type your password into chat, it appears as asterisks. It's censored out, no one can type it. So I typed my password and I lost my account. That happened about four more times. But that's the kind of social engineering scenario that is super rudimentary, but you, you get the process of how it happened. Trust was built. It's a friend. You've been playing with them for about a week, so you can trust them. They do something, and then they run off. Now, in modern day, it gets a little bit more uh, dicey if you were to play the game, as now you're dealing with potentially real-life money. And there are quite a lot of news articles about this game specifically, ranging from Venezuela economy actually depending on the game to even more hacking and phishing attempts that I highly recommend if you want to test your social engineering scenario skills, this is probably one of those games to play. Now let's move on to the rise of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is on the rise as we all know. Ever since ChatGPT, we've been doing pretty much anything you can imagine with artificial intelligence. And now that the average person has access to it, there's quite a lot you can do. So what is artificial intelligence? Basically, artificial intelligence is a language learning model that allows you to input information into it, and it actually learns the information and is able to regurgitate it to produce a result. Now, those results, may be accurate or may not be accurate. So you should always verify your information, especially if you're using AI to research. But let's, uh, let's show some examples of that. So for me, I asked Copilot, which is Microsoft's AI, draw me a picture that's non-copyrighted that I can use in the presentation today about AI. And it produced a robot. And there's quite a lot that you can do with this type of AI is you can produce funny pictures like robots. You can produce essays and summaries of information that you've seen on the web. But what that also means is that you can produce other content, such as voice clips, video, even faces. And that's what led to the FBI on May 8th of 2024, warning about the increasing threat of cyber criminals using artificial intelligence. Now, while we may see a lot of AI generated content today, and we always call it out as, hey, that's AI, you know, it's clearly fake. AI is a learning model and it is always evolving. So in, a tradition, in addition to those phishing tactics that we've talked about, where you're gaining trust, AI helps accelerate that. That phone call that you might hear from your parents might not actually be your parents, but someone who's taken the data of your parents' voice from them getting random calls, inputting it into AI, then regurgitating it back to your phone number because they got a data breach that shows all the related phone numbers in a family. That is at the level that we are at for AI. And to put into perspective how this could work as a business case, there's a story that we've heard through the grapevine of a chief financial officer being impersonated through AI and talks to a lower level employee. And what he does is he sends a Zoom link to the person says, hey, this is urgent. The employee hops on the Zoom link. You see the chief financial officer with his webcam on. You hear his voice. You see the CEO on and you hear their voice and they wanna authorize this transaction, the SAP. And what happens is that 
on the other side is not those actual people, but they're using deep fakes with their webcams and also deep faking their voice. Now, if you recall about, I'd say six or seven years ago, we do have deep fake laws that kind of went towards a more lewd area in terms of regulation, but we're starting to see those regulations be expanded. And that comes into the future and pitfalls of AI, which the future of AI is what we decide upon with regulations. Currently, there are a lot of infringement that AI is doing because it is trained as an intellect, well, trained as a language learning model, so you can infringe on intellectual properties. There are safeguards within certain AI that allow you to prevent breaking intellectual property, but there are ways to go around those safeguards. So, for example, if you had a chat GPT sub and you ask it to draw me Sonic the Hedgehog, it will not produce Sonic the Hedgehog, but if you ask it to draw a blue hedgehog, it actually produces Sonic the Hedgehog. So there's quite a lot of safeguards that are in place that are still being circumvented. And on top of that, as a learning model, there are AIs that are coming out which allow you to generate anything you want without any sort of safeguard. And that has led to lots and lots of arrests, law questioning, and regulations being proposed. Like, for example, child pornography is actually a huge thing within AI generation is we have people generating AI child pornography and getting the FBI involved into these, which is what's accelerating these kinds of regulations. So while we think AI might be useful today, it is basically the Wild West right now in terms of regulation. And what we're seeing is that the government is making an active effort to try and make sure that we are safeguarding, placing in these safeguarding controls within AI to prevent anything that would infringe on our rights, basically. And to expand on the deepfake law from, from previously, you can produce deepfakes with AI, and the legality of it right now is in a grayish area, but we are seeing regulations being passed that are outlawing it as well. So while you can hop on YouTube and browse pretty funny videos about you know, certain presidents playing Minecraft, with their voice, likeness, and even their face, those, as convincing as they are, might end up illegal later on. And in terms of how strong can AI be? So I put in a prompt to write me a whole script to talk about an IEE event in regards to cybersecurity and AI within the last two years. So it puts in a question if I'm actually reading that script right now or if every interaction is actually produced by that AI. Because as we know, it is a language learning model and the art of presenting and communicating any type of cybersecurity event has been quite, how should I say, long in our history of humans, despite how short the field of cybersecurity is. So there's quite a lot you can do and it leads into a lot of questions between what is actually AI generated if we are able to build enough trust, but also what should we do to prevent these kinds of things from happening if it turns out that we are using AI for nefarious deeds? And with that, we'll answer a question and answer. Yes. Yes. It seems like that most of the ransomware. Mm -hmm. So, at what point are the insurance companies going to step up and say no more? Like, what, what are they saying? What's the pressure there? So, I went to the Pacific Northwest Aerospace Alliance and I actually talked directly with a cybersecurity insurance specialist about these kinds of things. And what he was saying is that what cybersecurity insurance companies are going to start looking into is if we go back to that cybersecurity maturity model certification that I was talking about, they're looking for the base implementations now of NIST 800-171 to make sure that you have the basic level of cybersecurity implemented before they do a payout. Now, you have to, just like the way CMNC works where you have to testify and say, hey, I've got all these tools, you have to then testify to the insurance company and attest that you've implemented these cybersecurity measures. So 
once you have that in paper, if it turns out that you were ransomware and you have your documentation that shows, you know, we got socially engineered, they broke through our defenses, we were ransomware, then they would pay out in that format. But if it turns out you got ransomware and there's no antivirus, no multi-factor, no rotating passwords, you're missing policies, that puts the insurance into basically at their discretion if they want to pay out to you, which as the rules go on and once it hits next year and we see CMC go live and across the defense industrial base, they're all following this. For the private sector, insurance companies might not be as lenient to pay out. Yes. Yes. There have been a couple incidents where they've been directly compromised. Uh, usually in those cases, you should reinstate your multi-factor. So you should cancel out the code and then re-enroll your multi-factor. Uh, specific cases are lost right now to me as I'm blanking out on it, but it is a potential risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's usually if there is a point where multi-factor is compromised to the point where all the two FA codes as well are compromised, it would hit national news. So you'll you'll know pretty fast. Like the LastPass breach was pretty huge when they stole the source code. Every LastPass user was notified immediately that, hey, your LastPass, you know, here's a cybersecurity incident that's happened to us. Here's what we recommend. Here's the remediation. And next steps that you should perform. Yeah, no problem. So I have a question on the how the how the banking app are tracking the the transaction. Something happened recently that I thought. <laughs> a text that someone used my card in Florida. Uh, so, and then I, I said, this is not me, and they immediately uh, they discarded that card and sent me a new one. But how do they determine whether I travel to Florida or not? Because I previously happened that I traveled to say, Seattle and used the card, and not, there was no issue with that. Yeah, so let's see. So that, that's like a multi-layer answer right there. Uh, I guess the easiest way to explain it would be they're checking your transaction history, but also your functions that you're doing normally. So for example, um, <laughs> pretty funny that you mentioned going to Seattle and then using it and then it worked. Was for me, I went only to Northridge during college and my card was automatically declined because for the last 10 years, my history was only in uh, San Diego. So usually what banks are tracking, from my understanding, is that they're looking at your spending habits, what you're purchasing, uh, geolocation that you're usually using the service with, because it is an NFC chip usually, or if you're entering the number itself, it gets a little finicky, especially when online shopping. But uh, generally, from what I've noticed, is that if you are spending in a way that goes against how your usual spending habits are, it triggers an alert. So for me, for example, I went to get uh, headshots done. So, you know, professional pictures, wear a suit. And the second that I put my card in for a headshot, which I've never paid for in my life, it was automatically declined. And I had to call up my banking and then had to verify, go through all the multi-factor steps to show that I'm, I am who I am and then authorize the transaction. But that's generally the way that they're tracking it. So if you're buying food in San Diego and then you travel to Seattle the next day with no type of notification, but then you're buying from McDonald's again, that might be something that's just normal. But then for us, because we're not alerted on that, you might want to check your bank statement. Yeah. 
each of each of these things can have its have a risk factor, and once you pass a certain threshold, that you mm -hmm. can get the yeah. Spending habit and also departing from mm -hmm. yeah. And that's another thing that you can think about for multi-factor authentication as well is because you're using the physical card and it has an NFC chip built in, unless they replicated the NFC chip, you know, that means you're physically in possession of it. Okay. And the other question is about the, the scenario where it's the, the higher off the scale of the product. <laughs> Someone used a big thing twice and in the scale. Yes. So how do you prevent something like that. So in that case, there was three things that occurred, which is trust, sense of urgency, and then uh, kind of provoking and taunting the employee to actually do it. Because if you're on a phone call, a Zoom call, and your chief information, well, chief financial officer is there along with the CEO is also there, that puts a lot of stress on the employee to not mess up right there. So they use that sense of urgency to push you to do an action but the only way we can really prevent it is to verify the identification that this person is who they are. So the only way you could really prevent it, and I'll use an example. So let's say my CEO, Aaron Wyatt, gets on a Zoom call and he says, Raven, delete all of our code repositories. And says, you know, we're starting something new. It's a cool new program, but we need a clean, fresh slate. So delete all our code repositories. The first thing I would do because I do have access to his personal phone number, is call him and be like, Aaron, is this you right now? Is this real? But for your average employee, though, who does not have direct access to an executive official, the best case, well, best course I would do is to refer to your supervisor or whoever is ahead of you by one level and notify them of, hey, just want to verify like, this is you know, happening and then have it go through the right information channels to reach that person to verify rather than making uh, an urgent request. And that is one of the things I forgot to go over about for social engineering is you definitely want to make sure that if there is a sense of urgency and they are pressuring you to do an action, you should probably double check that action, especially if your instinct is kicking off that something seems a little off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a that's a good way too. Like if I say pineapple to Aaron, and then he knows that that's our code word for like I'm a real person, and no one else knows that, like just out of the blue, you know. No. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, but those kinds of things work too, especially among friends and family. You should probably make a code word, especially with the rise of AI and phishing and the way that phishing has evolved, definitely make a code word of your family, something that only you and your family know. And then if you ever need to verify that, hey, you know, my brother's in the hospital, he needs $1,000 right now because he's getting rushed to emergency. And if he gets rushed there, insurance is going to bill him. Then, um, you know, say the code word. Yes. By Gen AI or yes. Um, it's not the for, for example, the uh, scenario that you mentioned about the deep fake being the CFO. Mm -hmm. So, but do we have any security tool that can detect, you know, somehow link to video conferences, video calls, and detect whether um, the call, like the video, mm -hmm. So far from my understanding is we're not currently at that level since AI is pretty new as well. So it's kind of this uh, arms race, I would say, between deep fakes and phishing and then also technology that can detect the phishing. So similar to the way antivirus works where people make a virus and then CrowdStrike, for example, finds an answer to it and then they evolve it and it keeps us back and forth. The same thing is kind of happening at the same time with AI. challenge of financial institution uh, mistake or mislabeling a person 
or transaction. Let's see. Sorry, could you could you repeat the question? Is this in a chat? Yeah. How this can challenge the financial institution's mistake or mislabeling of person or transaction? So if the financial institution does a mistake by mislabeling. Oh, okay, okay. How this can be challenged? So I'll use my bank as an example, actually, because I frequently ran into this where they're really honestly strict about where financial transactions are happening. So they're very quick to on the dot to be, you know, cancel that transaction freeze right now. Uh, the first thing that I usually do, and this is something that is kind of scary when you think about how easy it is through a phone, is I'll call the support help desk. And what they'll verify usually is the bank account number, the account number itself, but also your social security number, which you would have to input into there. So that gives you two forms of identification is that you know the account number, you know the social security, and then it connects you to a representative. The representative for my bank specifically will then ask me um, three questions about latest addresses I've lived at and which one is my current, and then which one was my previous besides the current within the last 10 years. And then from there, you'll ask a couple more questions, verifying my identification, which include date of birth, first name, last name, uh, current zip code. And then also in the event that they haven't granted me access at that point, they'll also ask about the specific transaction, which if I'm declined and I'm calling them right there, I may be able to provide the exact transaction details. But if you're in the event where you're going to travel or you're going to live somewhere not really within your normal area, you should definitely contact your bank and let them know like, hey, you know, I'm going to move states to this place. So that way, the second that you arrive and you're hungry from the airport, you can actually use your card. Yeah, and usually for international travel, I'll do that. Yes. So you used to be drafting the CMMC or MCC? Oh. So that is currently being done by the government right now. It's a proposed rule that went live December. Uh, actually, yes, you can make comments on it. The public. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, to it's actually great idea, by the way, because what CMC actually is based on is the NIST SP eight hundred one seventy one, which is a huge acronym for saying cybersecurity. Uh, what do you need to implement? And part of that is cybersecurity awareness and training. So your idea of you know, if we're requesting information directly from you, don't give it, but then give the information if you're contacting us directly. You can actually write that into a policy to have your clients do. On our end, since we do manage service provider work as well, that brings into a lot of questions of, is the person calling the help desk actually the person calling the help desk? Especially as you expand as a company, you're not too sure if that person asking for an account reset is really the person it's assigned to. And what we have internally is a way where there's an application on your phone and it generates a two-factor code. Now, once you contact support, Support will ask for that two factor code before even dishing out any sort of information. And at our end, we enter that two factor code and it verifies the identity of the person 
by having them also press a button that identifies them. So there's layers upon layers. And as we see cybersecurity get more and more developed in enterprise and business, and even as a personal endeavor, we're going to see more and more of those happen. Now with banks, what's pretty frequent now is we have banking apps and that could be the next venue is they might request for a biometric authentication with the banking app when you call them to verify you are who you are. Yeah, and uh, about that uh, cause of action about hatching them. So with CMNC, there is a law that is attached to that called the False Claims Act. And currently, uh, when I last talked with the insurance person at uh, Seattle, it's around a hundred million to two hundred million dollar industry right now. And what people are doing is when they have those kinds of infractions that cause leakage of personal data, cause leakage of any sort of business data or sensitive information, you can call false claims on them, and per infraction you'll generate quite a huge fine towards it. Like, for example, uh, recently, I believe four weeks now, is that correct, Aaron, the Georgia Tech? Oh. Yeah, so around four weeks ago, Georgia Tech was in violation of controlled and classified information. And what happened was they actually got false claims acted for quite a huge sum of money, which is escaping my mind, but if you were to search up the Georgia Tech fine, it is a pretty recent event, and because they did not follow proper procedures, they were hit with a massive fine of millions of dollars. As it is a per infraction. Yes. Over here, I heard a comment earlier that uh, they had multi, they multi factor with enough security. Is that enough security for people that have multi factor? Oof. Well, uh, in my personal opinion, I, I would say two multi-factors per account with a password generated by a password manager is generally enough security for the average person. But for your more sensitive stuff, you might want other venues of protecting on top of that protection. Because as you gain more and more layers to protection, it does make it harder to get in. I'm talking about too on the device itself. So people think they have multi-factor. They'll think they have multi-factor authentication and they're secure and safe. But they don't realize the device itself, someone can get on there, steal a cookie, and mm -hmm. you know, access the number. That's where Raven's saying you want to reset those passwords and yep. so you want to keep your devices as secure as possible too. Yes. Started to see some pretty big fines for those. Oh yeah. The FCC and others. I think, in your opinion, large fines, this sort of regulatory penalties, does that really gain? Is that is that moving the needle at all? So, in my personal opinion, a fine is just something you could really pay off if you're in the wrong. But that's one of the reasons why I do like the CMC program that's coming out is that currently in law right now is we propose levels that you must meet prior to engaging in the type of business. Now, whether that comes into the private sector where you have to attest, be assessed to a certain cybersecurity standard, or you can't deal, um, well, you can't perform business, I think that should extend out into there as a fine is only as good like, let's say you make $100 million and the fine is 10 mil, you can afford the hit as your revenue will cover that cost. But if the fine is 10 million and you're unable to do business until you rectify all decisions, that's where we see accountability, which is something that is desperately needed, 
especially in concerning our personal information. Thank you.